Welcome to Windows Debugging and Troubleshooting. Uh, so for the next hour, I'm going to be talking about the debugging tools for Windows and how we can use those. And then also we'll have a look at using those tools against the operating system and also against applications so we can try and effectively or better troubleshoot uh, different types of problems that might appear on the Windows operating system. So. First of all, I'm going to go through the debugging tools. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the debugging tools are and why they're useful to us. One of the things we'll find out about the tool, though, is it has a rather steep learning curve. So although it's probably one of the most powerful tools you can use to diagnose problems on Windows, it's very difficult to get started with because it's all mainly command line driven. But once you start to understand some of the commands and why we're executing those commands, then the possibilities are endless. We'll also have a look at the architecture of Windows as well. And we'll talk a little bit about what it is that we're looking at with the debugger. So we'll talk about some of the different data structures. I'll define some of the terms in more detail. And we'll also look at the hardware as well. We'll talk a little bit about that. Without the hardware, Windows is just nothing. It's just a piece of code. So it needs this hardware to run. The applications interact with the operating system, which interacts with the hardware. So we can go and look at the hardware and look at how the operating system is interacting with the hardware. We can tell more about what the application is trying to do. So if we have an application that's crashed, for example, we can actually go back in time and actually look and find out what happened at the time of the crash. And we can analyze that, try and step back and actually try and identify exactly why this application crashed. So we'll have a look about in more detail how the operating system deals with crashes as well. So what happens when an application crashes? So we'll see the steps that the operating system takes. Not only that, we'll also see the steps that we can take as well. So we can go and attach a debugger, for example, to an application that's crashed. And we'll look at doing that. We'll step through one by one and we'll actually see exactly uh, how this happens. And then I'll finish up with some advanced debugging techniques. So we'll look at um, different types of scenarios where you might need to do additional steps to try and diagnose the type of problems that you're, uh, that you're working with. So before we kick off, uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I spent about seven years working at Microsoft. And so the last position I held was a senior escalation lead. So I spent pretty much all my time interacting with escalation engineers who would then interact with customers. And so I spent pretty much all my time looking at source code or stepping through uh, code in the debugger or looking at crash dumps. Being able to use these techniques that I'm going to show you now is probably allows me to, to do my job or allow me to do my job um, much more efficiently. So as I, as I said, we'll have a look at some of these techniques, how we can actually drill down and find out exactly what's going on. It's also useful to understand how the tool works as well because what if the tool's broken. What if you try and run the tool and the tool's not giving you the right information? If we know where that information is coming from, we can then make a decision about what we're seeing in the tool. Is that the right information that we're seeing back from the operating system? I also work uh, now, I left Microsoft a couple of years ago, I work with David Solomon. And David, as you might know, is the co-author of the Windows Internals book series. So the Windows Internals book uh, is currently in the fifth edition. Uh, the sixth edition is going to press this month, uh, so it should be out uh, in the stores shortly. And it's also being split into two sections, so there'll be part one and also be part two. Uh, part two should be released maybe three, four months after, and that's going to contain information about uh, a crash dump uh, analysis as well. So a lot of the stuff that we cover today, there's going to be follow-up information uh, in the book in regards to that. Okay, so let's jump in and start. Uh, having a look at the, the debugging tools. So the debugging tools are just a package available from Microsoft. So you can go and get these, Microsoft.com. And there's two ways to get them. One is using the SDK, which is the Software Developer Kit. And the other one's using the WDK, which is the Windows Driver Kit. Each of those have a web-based installer. You can just go through and select that you want the debugging tools. And once you do that, it goes and installs a set of debuggers on the box that we can go ahead and use. So there's four debuggers that get installed. CDB, NTSD, KD, 
and WinDBG. KD is really just a, a debugger for debugging the operating system itself. So for us, if we're focusing on applications, we're only really interested in either using CDB, NTSD, or WinDBG. Now, they all use the same engine, the same DLL, and so the commands that you type in any one of those will work across all of those debuggers. So you can choose exactly which ones you wish to use. Uh, NTSD, CDB, there's a command line driven, and I'm going to focus on using WinDBG, which is a graphical version. So it's just a little bit easier to be able to scroll back sometimes and uh, have a look and cut and paste a lot easier when we're trying to debug. So several ways to start the debuggers, and I'm going to go through all of this as well. We have demonstrations, so we'll see exactly all the different ways we can, uh, we can attach. Um, just a quick question. Who here uh, works in development? OK, quite a few people. IT pros? Who's just lost and came here just because they had nothing else to do? Doesn't work in any of those. No one. OK, so we've got the right target audience. So several ways that we can uh, attach to the target. We can attach to a running process. So we have an application that's already started. It's already running. At any point, if we need to, we can launch the debugger, break in, and have a look at the state and find out exactly what's happening inside of that application. We can also go and launch the application under the debugger. So it's running under the debugger by default. If any crashes happen, the debugger's already there. We can start debugging. Or another option is we can do crash analysis. So this is post-mortem debugging. So this is the application has already crashed. You have a dump file. You've been given the dump file. You can open that in the debugger, and you can step through that. And I have some examples of that as well. We'll have a look at a little bit later on. In order to attach to a process, though, you need to know one of two things. You either need to know the name of the process that you're attaching to, or then you need to know the identifier. And we'll look at different ways we can locate this information as well uh, shortly. So the debuggers are configurable. And so if we're looking at using WinDBG, it supports workspaces. So different people have different styles of working. So within the debugger, you can actually go and set up the different windows where you like them, save that information. Next time you go into the debugger, that's available there for you. It supports a command line interface as well. So everything that I'm going to do here today, it's all scriptable. So I could write all of these commands into a, into a text file, save that text file, and then I could go and launch the debugger and pass in those script. So then I can automate the whole process. So I can automate attaching, I can automate detaching, I can automate doing a dump, I can automate doing the analysis. In order to do that, though, uh, one thing we need to set up in the configuration-wise is we need to set up symbols. And I'll talk a little bit about symbols on the next slide. So for the IT pros, um, one thing I want to try and do with this talk is I want to try and bridge the gap between IT pros and developers. A lot of IT pros sit there and wonder what developers do all day. I wonder what developers do all day. If we can stop and think for a minute and start to think like a developer, we can sort of understand a little bit more about how this application is working and how it might have ended up in this position where it's crashed. So in order to do that, we're going to need to look at a little bit of source code. And so if I'm talking about symbols, symbols are just collections of symbols within a file. So this is a binary file that the debugger needs in order to understand what it is that we're looking at. So the question is, well, what's contained inside of a symbol file? If we have a look at uh, an example here, this is just a small piece of uh, C code. And this doesn't really do a lot, but there's some interesting things here that we should know. First of all, we have this display greeting. So display greeting is the name of the function. So I've gone and written this function. I've called it display greeting, which means that anywhere in my piece of code, I can go and call display greeting, and it'll go and execute whatever happens inside of this function. What's useful, though, is that function name ends up in the symbol. So if I'm able to go and have a crash dump, and I can go and dump out information, and I see a reference to display greeting, I have some understanding of where I am. And it makes sense to give these 
names, names that describe what the function does. So without me looking at the source code, if I just looked at the name display greeting, I have some understanding of what it does. There's a function in Windows called create file. Without looking at the source code, you can understand that that function has something to do with creating a file. Uh, the next symbol we have, we have the parameters. So these are the values that are sent to that function. So you might want to go and reuse that function over and over again. In this case, if I go and call display greeting and I pass in different parameters, it's going to display different information on the console. And the final bit we have is we have uh, also what's known as local variables. So these are just temporary storage that that function needs. So when the computer is executing this piece of code, it has a memory region, it stores these values in. Once it's done, it goes ahead and, and discards that information. And of course, functions can go and call other functions. So here we see a reference to printf, which is just a C runtime function. All printf does is just go and display the information on the console. So a very, very simple piece of code. So how does that tie into debugging? Well, if we have a look, that information there, that's what gets generated by the compiler. That's all the computer cares about. The computer doesn't care about function names. The computer doesn't care about the names of the variables. All of that information gets discarded. So we had a crash dump, and all we saw was a whole bunch of hex values. It's going to be extremely difficult to understand what's going on. So that's where symbols come into play. And you can see some examples here that because I have symbols for the application, now I can actually find where in memory that display greeting function is. I can also see, for example, when it goes and calls another function. So here I can see it's going and calling something. I can see that something is printf. So it makes, all use, makes it more useful uh, trying to understand exactly what's going on. Uh, configuring symbols can be somewhat of a nightmare. Uh, it used to be somewhat of a nightmare. It's much more simpler now. Microsoft have available a symbol server on the internet. So for the symbols that they publish, which is pretty much all of the binaries in Windows, those are available on this website, and they're all indexed. And so the debugger actually knows how to work out the fingerprint to find that image that it's looking for. So what you go and do is if you go and set the environment variable uh, listed there on the slide, if you set that once, all the debugging tools will go and read that environment variable. And then they know to go, when they need to do so, to go and fetch those symbols off the website. So then you have the debugging information that the debugger needs, and then we can start troubleshooting. If at any point, though, uh, you have problems with the symbols, there's one command that's rather useful that's built into the debugger, and that's called bang sim noisy. So turning on bang sim noisy, if I execute bang sim noisy, it turns on tracing code inside the debugger itself. And so it tells me about where it's trying to load the symbols from. And I'll show you why that's useful uh, shortly. If at any point you need to get assistance, of course, you can just press F1. All of the commands I'm going to show in this session, they're all documented inside of the help file. So that's one of the best places to actually start looking to find out more information about what these do. So I'm going to talk about some of the commands. And some of these commands take different parameters depending on what you want the command to do. So if you want to find more about those, install the debugging tools, open up the help file, search for the command, and uh, you'll be able to find that information there. Uh, one useful thing in the debugger as well, it also supports autocomplete. As I said, it's all command line driven. But if you go into the command window and you press the tab key, it'll actually cycle through all the commands that it knows about. So you can actually find that there's some undocumented commands in there, which are also useful uh, when we're debugging. So let's have a look at uh, opening up or launching some processes uh, using WinDBG. So first I'm going to look at attaching to a process. So I'm just going to go and launch Notepad. And I'm also going to go and launch WinDBG. And what I'm going to do now, just on the File menu, we have this option here that says Attach to a process. And you'll see the shortcut key for that is F6. So later on, if I reference F6, it just means I'm just bypassing that one option. So I select Attach to a process. It now goes and enumerates a list of all the processes running on the system. And now I can actually 
go ahead and I can attach to those. So if I scroll down the list, and you'll see down the bottom there, it says Notepad. And if I go and click OK, you'll see that we're now attached. And we see some debugging information. And we'll look at that in more detail uh, shortly. One thing you'll notice, though, if I just zoom out and I try and access Notepad, you see that I can't get access to the window. The reason for that is because it's broken in, so that application's not responding to any of those clicks. So in order to get that application back, I can just come back into the debugging window. I can just use the G command, which means to go. And now if I try and access that window, you see I'm now able to type. And if I need to, I can go back and break into that again and execute any debugging commands, and then hit go again and continue. Uh, one thing to note about the debugger, though, um, if I go and kill the debugger, that kills the debugging session. So if I go back to my debugger and I click X, you see what just happened to the Notepad window? It just died, which for Notepad, I'm not really worried about. But if that was my Exchange store and I'm servicing 5,000 clients, that's 5,000 people without email access right now. So you need to be careful. There are different ways we can uh, get rid of that. We can actually detach, and I'll show you that shortly. The other option uh, from a command line, one thing I've done with the debugging tools, I went and changed my path. So my debugging tools are in my path. If I type any command, it'll look in the path and find the debuggers. So I could say, for example, just go and say run uh, WinDBG and just say Notepad. And you'll see it goes and launches the debugger. One thing you'll notice, though, that if I look down the bottom, that there's no reference. There's no Windows or Notepad window at the moment. The reason for that is because the debugger has broken in before this application's actually started. So again, I can just go ahead and press G, and you'll see now that window appears. And we're running inside the debugger. To break in, I can jump back to the debugger, and you'll see the break option here on the menu, on the toolbar. If I click on that, it now breaks into the application. If I want to close the debugger but leave that session open, I can use the QD command, which means detach and then quit. QD, the debugger goes away. You'll see, though, that notepad window is still there, and I can still type in that. OK. So we'll talk a little bit then about the architecture under Windows. And we'll come back to the debugger again. We'll look at some more of the tools. Once we explain the architecture in a little bit more detail, we'll see how we can use the debugger to actually look at some of the information that's being explained. So when I talk about hardware architecture, the first thing I want to talk about are registers. And registers are just units of or storage locations inside of the CPU. And so if we look at the memory hierarchy on the system, these are the fastest bits of memory that can be accessed. So as we move away from the CPU, things get slower. So we move into still staying on the CPU, but we move into the different caches. It's slower for the system to go and access those. If we move out to system RAM, it becomes even slower. If we go out to disk, magnitude slower. So these are extremely fast, but they're also limited in the number of them and also the size. So when we talk about a 32-bit CPU or a 64-bit CPU, what we're really talking about is the size of the registers that, or how much information these registers can hold. So a 32-bit CPU, each register in that, C in that CPU can hold a maximum of 32 bits. So by looking at the different registers, we can work out the architecture type from the system, and we'll see that shortly as well. So the system uses a whole bunch of registers uh, to store different things. And it's up to the compiler when the source code is generated which registers it uses. And why is this of use to us? Well, if we have a crash dump, for example, and we go and look at these registers, we can work out where we were. And we can also maybe find more information that points to something useful. So there's a register in the CPU called the IP register which is the instruction pointer. That's the location in memory where the CPU is going to execute code from. So we have a crash dump. If we look at the IP register, we'll know exactly where we were when it crashed. That's a good starting point. 
and we'll see how we can actually go on from that a little bit further. Now these names also vary depending on the architecture. You'll see on a 32-bit system all the registers start with E. On a 64-bit system they start with R. So by again looking at the names of the registers, we can tell the architecture. The more we understand about the machine the application is running under, the easier it is for us to troubleshoot because then we can work out what could be the problem and what might not be the problem. So to get access to that, we can use the R command in the debugger. And I'll bring this up shortly. We'll actually, I'll talk about this in more detail. The next thing is virtual memory. So Windows uh, has support for a flat, addressed, virtual environment. So what that means is there's no segmentation involved. The, the lowest address is zero on the system, and it goes up as high as as much memory as the CPU can support. So on a 32-bit CPU, if we work out the maths, we have 2 to the power of 32. That gives us a value of 4 gigabytes. So what Windows does is it actually goes and splits up that address range. So it maps 2 gigabytes to system address space, and it allows the additional 2 gigabytes to be given to the process. So what that means is every 32-bit process under Windows can access 2 gigabytes of memory we don't necessarily have to have that much memory in the box. We could run on a system that has 512 megabytes. It then becomes the job of the virtual memory manager to actually go ahead and to fool the applications into thinking they still have access to that, that full two gigabyte range. 64 bits a different, uh, different story. Uh, if you go and do the maths, two to the power of 64 gives you a value of 16 exabytes which I think is a ton, a ton of memory, but who knows, in 20 years' time, we could be walking around with iPhone 13s that come standard with you know, terabytes of memory in them. So at the moment, Windows actually doesn't use all those 64 bits. It only uses a small subset. So what it actually does is allows 8 terabytes per process and 8 terabytes for the system. So this is useful because we can use the debugger to go and look at these virtual memory addresses, find out what's there. So we can see if there's DLLs, modules loaded to that address. We can find out if there's data. That's going to help us try and work out why our application crashed. So to look at virtual memory, we have a whole bunch of commands. And they all start with D. So D for display or D for dump. And we can pass in different values, actually display the, diff the data in different formats. And again, I'll show you that shortly. So another thing I want to talk about I've used the term process before, and I haven't really defined what that is. And also tied up with the process is what's known as a thread. So the process is just the virtual environment, so that virtual address space that we spoke about, that Windows creates for the application to run under. So it contains a mapping of all, if we look at a 32-bit system, that 2 gigabyte address space. It keeps track of what's inside of that. And there's attributes then assigned to that process as well. So each process, for example, gets a process ID. So we could have multiple instances of Notepad. They're all going to be called notepad.exe if we look in Task Manager. But each one will have a unique process ID. So if we can find the process ID for the process we're interested in, then we know in the debugger that we're targeting the right thing. The system also uses threads. And threads are the units of execution within the system. So these are the bits that actually execute code on the CPU. And so inside of a process, we have at least one thread, and we can, of course, have multiple threads as well. So it's up to the application de developer to decide how many threads they want to use inside of that. So we can actually use commands inside the debugger to look not only at the process, but we can look at all the different threads as well and see exactly what's happening across the whole process. So in order to do that, uh, one of the most useful commands is using the tilde command. So the tilde command by itself, as we'll see, will dump out a list of those threads. And then we can go and select the ones that we're interested in, switch to those, and dump out more information. And what are we going to be interested in? Well, one thing we're going to be looking at is what's known as a stack. So inside of that virtual address space, inside of that process address space, Windows reserves a small piece of memory 
for each thread. So each thread has its own stack. And I spoke about local variables before, and I spoke about when we were calling those functions. When we go and call a function, that information gets stored on the stack. The reason being is once that piece of code executes, the operating system needs to know where to go back to. So where was that code called from? Where was that piece of code called from? All of this information is stored there on the stack. What's useful for us, though, is if we can look at the stack, we can actually find out not only where we are, but also how we got there. And that can tell us half of the reason why this crashed. If we look at two crashes, and they crash in the same spot, but they have different execution paths, it could be that you're looking at two different problems. So you might need to go ahead and break those up. To look at the stack inside the debugger, we use what's known as the k command. And of course, there's different parameters we can pass to this to display the information in different ways. And we'll look at this in the debugger as well in more detail. It looks a little bit scary at the start, but the way we read the stack is we start from the top and we work our way down. Now, this is where it's useful to have symbols. If I didn't have symbols, all I'd see is just a whole bunch of offsets into these modules because I have the symbols for not only the application itself, but also the operating system. I can look at these function names. Now, without having source code access to any of these, I can kind of have a guess about what some of these do. So I can see there, for example, main, which is the main piece of code that executes inside of my application, which in this case happens to be called hello.exe. We can see main goes and calls display greeting. And we saw from that snippet of code, we saw that display greeting goes and calls printf. So what's at the top of the stack was the very last thing to execute. What's down the bottom of the stack was the first thing. So if we have a look at the bottom of the stack, you'll notice it says here this RTL user thread start. All user mode threads in Windows start at this address. So we'll see this in all of those. What happens next above that depends on what the application does. So let's have a look at that then uh, in a little bit more detail. I have Notepad already running, so I'm just going to go ahead and attach to that. So I'm just going to go ahead and press F6. And what I can do now is just scroll through the list, find that instance of Notepad, and then just click OK. So you'll see one of the first things that debug has actually gone and done. If you look closely over here on the right-hand side, you'll see a list of all the loaded modules. So we can see the image name. So in this case here, it's notepad.exe. Then we can see all the different DLLs that are loaded, the dynamic link libraries. So these contain other bits of code that the developer might want to call. So some of these are for the operating system itself, some of these because the developer explicitly went ahead and called them. Not only that, we can also see where they're loaded from. So here we can see that most of the stuff's coming out of the System32 directory. But here, for example, we can see modules loaded from the side-by-side -side directory. So we had a conflict with different versions. If we had an application that worked with one DLL, didn't work with another DLL, we can actually attach to that and actually find out where is it loading that DLL from. And then we can go and investigate that DLL in more detail. So I spoke about looking at the registers. What can you tell about the architecture of my machine based on these register names? It's a 64-bit machine. Okay, We can see because 64 bits inside that register value, if it was a 32-bit machine, those values would be half the size. Plus, they would have different names as well. They'd be called EAX. So if this was a crash dump and I knew nothing about this system and I started looking at this, I could immediately tell Okay, 64-bit application. And I know it's Notepad because I can see Notepad loaded in that list of modules. I spoke about the instruction pointer. If we look at the address here, we'll see this 0530, so the final address. If we look down the bottom here, 0530. So the debug has actually gone and performed an additional step for us. What it's gone and done is it's gone and read the instruction pointer. 
looked up in the symbols, found out what functions at that address, and then gone and displayed it. And in this case, we can see that we're sitting inside a piece of code called dbg breakpoint, which makes sense. One of the things the operating system does when I go and attach a debugger to a process, it goes and creates a thread inside of that process, and it tells that thread, go and execute this piece of code, which tells it to execute a breakpoint, which makes it break into the debugger. So then we can actually go ahead and start troubleshooting. I spoke about the D commands as well, so we can look at memory. So let me scroll up. Here we'll see the module. These values on the left-hand side, the first one represents whereabouts in that virtual address space that module's loaded. The next column talks about the upper limit. So it goes from this address to this address. So if we go and dump out that address range, we can see that module. So if I just go and highlight that, and if I right click, that information is now copied to the clipboard, so I don't need to go and type that. And I could go and say DB. D for display, B for bytes. So it goes and dumps out that memory address and displays it as a range of bytes. One thing the debug has done that is also useful, if I scroll across, you'll see it's also gone and displayed an ASCII representation of what's at that address. This is useful because sometimes you find stuff that's meaningful. Sometimes you find information that points to some kind of string that would have been written to an event log. So that could give you more idea of what the application was doing at the time of the crash. Now, I can use the exact same address, but I can use a different command. I could say DC. DC means display this as D words, which means display it as 32-bit values. Using the same address, if we look at the values, if we compare those, 00905A4D, you'll see that there. And again, you'll see that ASCII representation of that. So we can use different commands to look at the data in different ways, depending on what it is that we're looking at. I also mentioned threads as well. We can use the tilde command. So just executing tilde by itself shows me a list of what's inside of that. What are the threads inside of this process? So at the moment, I have two threads. And each one's given a unique index. So they start at zero, and they just get incremented. Now, the only thing that uses this is the debugger itself. So I can say, show me the stack of the thread with index zero. Show me the stack with index one. One other thing the debugger's actually gone and done, though, is it's displayed the process ID and also the thread ID. And as I said, these are unique in the system. Now, one thing that's a little bit difficult here to understand is these values are in hexadecimal. Most of the tools that we use in Windows display this as a decimal value. So how do we convert this to decimal? Well, we can do this inside the debugger itself. I can just go ahead and, again, highlight that, right-click, and I can use the evaluation command, which is just a question mark. And in this case, it comes back and it tells me that value in hex is actually 4800. So if I was looking inside Task Manager and I pulled up the process ID column, that's the value I would see. OK. So let me just quit out of that. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit more then about application crashes. Who's seen a Windows application crash? Rather, who's not seen a Windows application crash? There's going to be less hands. OK. Anyone who's not seen a Windows application crash? obviously hasn't used Windows for more than five minutes. Who's seen a Windows application crash in the last week? Still quite a few people. Who's seen it crash in the last day? OK. What about now? Who's crashing right now? Anyone crashing right now? Was your mystery application explorer.exe? Was it Internet Explorer? No. OK. Windows 8. The whole operating system crashed. So why do Windows application crashes? Well, applications crash because of an unhandled exception. And what's an exception? Well, an exception is an event that occurs outside the normal flow of control. 
So it's something that's not expected. Now, different reasons for exceptions. There could be hardware exceptions, there could be software exceptions. An example of a hardware exception would be dividing by zero. So if you took the number zero and you tried to divide that by something, the CPU is going to generate an exception. And what's going to happen is then the application is then going to be triggered that that actually happened. Now, Windows uses something known as structured exception handling. And what this does, it actually, when an exception occurs, it allows the application the chance to control that exception. So the application can, in this way, they can become more resilient. So they can actually, the developer can specify, you know what, if I call this piece of code, there's maybe like a 10% chance that this thing might generate an exception, in which case I'm going to write a piece of code to deal with that exception. So they can, for example, quietly dismiss that exception if they decide it's safe to do so and continue execution. Now, if they don't have an exception handler to deal with this information, what actually happens then is the operating system passes it on to what's known as the unhandled exception filter. And this is what we're going to see when we see crashes. Because what it actually means is an exception's been raised, the application had a chance to deal with it, it didn't deal with it, so now the operating system has to do something. And the end result, what we'll see is we'll see a pop-up dialog box that says this application's crashed. Because what's happened inside of that unhandled exception filter is it's tried to go ahead and then report the fault. So the user or the administrator can then go ahead and actually do something about it. So prior to Windows Vista, there was a tool called Dr. Watson, which if you've used Windows for quite a while, you would have had a few visits from the doctor. That was replaced in Windows Vista with a tool called Windows Error Reporting. One of the cool things about Windows Error Reporting is it not only deals with application crashes, it also deals with system crashes as well. And it also has a chance to send that information back to Microsoft so they can gather data about those types of crashes so they can see that those crashes get fixed in the next release of the operating system or in the next service pack. Or if it's critical, they can actually push those fixes out in a hotfix. Third-party application developers as well can also subscribe to this information so they can get crashes, information about their crashes as well, so they can use that information to fix their own apps. There's also a central location for this as well. So if you go into the Action Center, you can actually find out a list of all the crashes that you've had on the system. And you can also go and find out, is there a solution available? If Microsoft gets a whole bunch of crashes and they eventually go and fix that problem, they can publish a solution. So the next time it crashes, you're taken to this website, in which case you can actually follow the information on the screen. It might be that you need to change the configuration information. It might be, here's a new hotfix. Download this hotfix, and the problem's solved. So as I said, this was introduced in Windows Vista and a great tool, but it had one slight flaw. Like one slight flaw. That was, it didn't save full dumps. So we're going trying to troubleshoot this information. We're talking about getting dump files to look at these. There were only limited dumps available to us. So there was a fix made in SP1 for Windows Vista. If you go and change that registry key, you can actually go and specify that you want the system to keep a full dump. What's also useful, though, is you can actually specify how many dumps you want to keep. Dr. Watson would only keep the last dump. Now you can tell the system that you want to keep 10 dumps, or you want to keep 50 dumps. So if you have two applications that crash within three minutes of each other, you have both of those crashes. So you can go back and analyze each one of those separately. They may or may not be related, but at least we have that information available to us. So what can we do if an application crashes? What if we don't have that key set in the registry and we want to get access to a full dump? Well, it turns out that when an application crashes, that process still exists in memory. The operating system still keeps that address space available. It's not until the unhandled exception filter finishes doing what it needs to do that that process gets torn down. That unhandled exception filter won't finish executing until it's actually gone ahead, reported the fault to the Windows error reporting fault service, 
and you've gone ahead and dismissed the dialog box. So as long as you keep that dialog box on the screen, you can go back to that dialog box and attach a debugger. The process is still there. And we'll look at doing that. In order to do that, though, we need to, we need to know the PID. So we need to know the process ID. One way of finding the process ID for the application that crashed, that information gets passed to the Windows error reporting executable, or Werfault. If we look at the command line for Werfault, we can actually find out why it crashed. So let's have a look at doing that. So I'm going to go and open up the debugger. And I have an application here. This is called Toaster Application. If I go and run the Toaster Application, you'll see the familiar Windows error reporting dialog box. So it got as far as creating a window. We saw a window pop up for the application, but then it crashed. Now, if I didn't have a full dump configured, what can I do? As long as I leave this dialog box here, I still have a chance to go back and look and find out what happened. So what I can do is switch to my debugger. And I can just go ahead, again from the file menu, just say attach to a process. And if I scroll down and I look under were fault, we'll see there's now an entry there because that fault's been triggered. And if I expand that out, and if I look at the command line, and this is not going to wrap for me, but let me see if I can try and capture this information. You'll see very quickly there that it has the process ID. So the process ID of the application that crashed is 4872. So what I need to do now is go and find 4872. And if I look in more detail, you'll see over here on the left-hand side, it actually references those process IDs. 4872 happens to be my toaster application. So I'm just going to go ahead and select that and click OK. Now I could just dismiss this and just say, well, the toaster application, ever since I installed it, it's always kept crashing. So I could go and open up a support call with a vendor, and they could try and send me a new version, and I could put that on the box, and it still keeps crashing. I have no idea why it crashed. The vendor has no idea why it crashed. But if I go and perform some additional steps, if I take five more minutes of my time and look at this inside the debugger, I might be able to actually get somewhere. So we can see, for example, the tilde command. This time we see there's three threads. Now, we looked at the stack command in the slide. We saw dumping, pressing K goes and dumps out the stack for that thread. Now, it's done it for one thread. We want to go and look at all the threads. In this case, there's only three, so it's not too much work to go and switch between each one of those. But if we had 300 threads, then that's a lot of work. So we can actually use automation in the debugger to help us out. And the way we can do that is by using the tilde star command. So tilde star means for each thread in this process, execute this command. And in this case, we want to execute the k command. So now what it goes and does, the debugger goes and jumps back to the first thread, dumps out the stack. If it needs to, we'll go and fetch the symbols from that website. It'll then jump onto the next thread, dump out its stack, and continue until all the threads in that process have been dumped out. So what we can do now is we can actually go back and scroll up to the top, and we can actually have a look. So here we can see the thread with index 0, the thread with index 1, and so on. So here we're looking at the stack, and here you'll see there's no symbol information. So I just have that hexadecimal values. But I have symbols for the operating system. So you'll see here, for example, I have function names. Most of the time, you're going to be debugging without symbols because third parties don't release those. So this will be the normal situation. But that's not going to stop us. We can still find out a lot about what happened inside this crash. So this just seems to be a fairly normal crash. It doesn't seem, or sorry, a normal thread. There doesn't seem to be very much going on. So let's go and look at the next thread, the next stack for the next thread. And this is where it gets interesting. Again, without understanding the code behind these, just looking at these function names, I can see this is the thread that was dealing with the crash. Why? Because there's mentions to things such as report fault. Remember, we start at the top, and we work our way down. So what was at the top of the stack was the last thing to execute. So what happened? Starting at the top, working down, it was reporting a fault. 
to Windows Error Reporting Service. Why did we report a fault? Well, let's continue down. There's that unhandled exception filter. So it seems that there was an exception generated inside this application, which the application didn't deal with. So the operating system had to deal with it itself. Where did that happen, though? Well, below then we see the exception dispatcher. This is the piece of code that took the exception and now needs to find the dispatcher. So this is the piece of code that looks at the application and tries to give the application a chance. So what happened before that then? Well, let's keep scrolling down a little bit further. We don't have symbols, but what we see is we see there's a module loaded inside that address space called malware. Seems a little bit suspicious. How can we find out more about this module? Well, we can use a command called LM, which means listed or loaded modules. List, show me a list of all the modules loaded inside that process address space. And I can use the V command, which means verbose. So show me as much information about this module as possible. And then I can pass in the M command, which means matching. So show me as much information you can about the module called malware. And it goes and reads the version information off the module. If I scroll up, we'll see, for example, it's stalled. There's a module inside the system32 directory. Um, wow, we even have a company name. Malware Industries. If this was a real piece of malware, you're probably not going to see a company name there or a version information copyright notice. This was actually something I put together. But this is just an example of, here's an application. It looked like it was the toaster application. We looked at the crash, and we found malware loaded inside that application. So really, it wasn't the toaster application's fault at all. It's the fault of malware. So the next step would be to find out how this thing got on the box. So then I could use tools like auto runs from sysinternals, for example, and try and troubleshoot it that way. Okay. Uh, another way of being able to, to do this is to look at a crash dump as well. So if I just go and click on the file menu, we see we have an option here that says open crash dump. Now I have a crash dump from another system, and it's stored here on my desktop. And so I'm just going to go and jump to that. It's inside the tech days folder. It's just called user.dmp. And that's all we know about this at the moment. So let me just go ahead and click open. And let me just zoom out for a second so we can see the full screen. So we'll see the debug has actually gone and dumped out some information for us already. So what's it displaying? Well, there's some useful stuff here. It tells us that it's server 2003. It tells us the service pack level, so we can see that it's service pack 2. We can see there's two CPUs in the system, so it's a multiprocessor system. We can also see the architecture, so here it says x86, which again is useful. And what's really of use here is also it tells us when the crash happened. So in this case, we can see that this happened 2009, so the 5th of November. Now, this information is actually, you see on the right-hand side, it says UTC plus 2. That's because I've set my time zone to be here in Helsinki. So the crash might have actually happened at a different time where this crash was taken. So you actually need to go and work that out. But I can also see, for example, how long this process was up for. In this case, this process was up for 11 hours, 15 minutes, which is pretty good for a Windows application, I think, running by itself and not crashing. But looking at that time as well gives us some idea of the frequency of the problem. If we saw a very low uptime, then this problem might be a little bit more severe than we think. The question is, though, what is this program? What is this application? Well, I can go and use a command called bang peb. So we spoke about the process. Inside the process is a data structure known as the process environment block. And it contains a whole bunch of things such as the environment variables that are used by that application. It also contains a command line. So here, for example, we can see that it's SVC host. And we can also see it's running inside the net services group. So this is quite a critical process. 
you lose this, you lose a lot of stuff on Windows. So this is rather a severe problem. We have an SVC host crashing on the operating system. SVC host is launched automatically when the system starts. How long has the system been up for? Around about 11 hours, 15 minutes since the last reboot. So we can tell that not only the application restarted, the whole operating system had to be restarted as well. So how do we find out more about what happened? Well, we can use the tilde command. And you'll notice that for some reason the debugger's gone and selected the thread with the index of five. Does that mean there's only six threads in this application? Not necessarily. In this case, you'll see that there's 58. It says 57, but it starts at zero. So we need to include that as well. So we have 58 different threads. So why was thread five, or the thread with index five, so important? Let's scroll up and have a look. We'll see there's a little dot next to that. That means that was the thread that took the exception. So that's the thread of interest. So what we should do is we should go and look at the stack and actually find out what's so interesting about that thread. Again, it's just a case of starting at the top, working our way down to the bottom. A Little bit different than what we saw before because this was using a different fault reporting tool because it was Windows Server 2003. But we can see the report fault, we can see the unhandled exception filter, we can see the ex exception dispatcher. This is a little different though. Last time we saw the module name, so we could clearly see malware. In this case, we just have some, what looks to be like a random address. So the first question is, well, what's at that, at that address? So we can go back and we can use one of those commands to dump out that address and actually look and see what's going on. So let's do that, cut and paste, DC, I could have used DB, whatever, doesn't matter. But in this case, it comes back and we just get a whole bunch of question marks. And what this means is that this address wasn't mapped inside of that address space. There's nothing there at that address. What happened was a piece of code tries to reference this address and then crashed because there's nothing there. So what piece of code was trying to execute or trying to read or write to that address? Well, if we go back and we look at the stack, we can keep stepping back and actually find out exactly what's going on. One thing you'll notice here, it talks about a return address. This return address is actually the next value in the stack. So the debugger actually looks at the return address, then goes and loads symbol information based on that. So if I took this return address, once that executes, it's gonna jump back into this function here. So I just keep stepping back one frame at a time. So this crashed, we know there's nothing here. So the question is, what's at this address then? Because at some point, it's gonna to wanna to jump back to that point and execute code. So we'll go and dump that out. Just using the DC command. URL mon. URL mon's a DLL that sits inside the system32 directory. And what does it do? Its job is to actually go and download resources from websites. Why would an SVC host on a server want to be downloading stuff from a website? What's even more interesting is if you look uh, just after that, we can actually see the URL. Anyone, any networking engineers here? Can anyone tell me anything interesting about that address or anything that's specific to that address? It's an internal address. That address is not routable on internet. Why would an internal SVC host want to be talking to another machine with an IP address on a strange port, port 8195? What actually happened in this case, the next step was to actually go and find out what was at that address. It turned out it was a Windows XP workstation. There's no reason why a system 
sitting inside a data center would want to go and talk back to a Windows XP machine to pull down files. What actually happened was this service host hadn't been patched, and so there was an exploit, and so there was a worm sitting on this XP machine, was sending packets to the SVC host. SVC host was, it was trying to execute code, but it turns out that the worm actually had a bug in it, and so it crashed. So what we could do, we could patch this, then we could actually go and find out who, the, who wrote this worm, and we could actually go back and send them some crash analysis results and say, here you go. Next time you write a worm and you try and infect my machine, do it the right way. Here's the right piece of code. All right. So that leads me to some advanced debugging techniques. So one of the ways we can take a dump if we need to do some offline analysis. And why this is useful is you have an application that's crashed and you want to get that application up and running as soon as possible. In the case of the Exchange Store, for example, you want that up and running so people can then go and access their inboxes and read their email. You've gone and restarted that, but because you have a crash dump, you can then work offline. So you're under a lot less pressure. So one of the take homes from this session is go and install the debugging tools on a workstation. They don't need to be on the same machine. So you have a server machine. You don't need to do the debugging there. You can do all this debugging on your own workstation. Install the tools, configure your symbol path. If you have crash dumps, open them up and have a look. Because it might give you some more information about what it is that's going on. So you can spend that time. The system's up and running. You can then go and work offline and find out why it crashed so it doesn't happen again next time. So different ways we can take a dump. We can use the debugger. So there's a dot dump command inside of that. And with that, if you look at the help file, you can actually specify different types of parameters. So you can say the size of the dump that you want. So you can take what's known as a mini dump, which is a very small subset. So these are somewhere between you know, several hundred kilobytes in size. So very, very small. You can email those around. Or you could take a complete dump, which is that full process address space. Or rather, the amount of memory taken up inside of that full process address space. So on a 64-bit system, your exchange store could be taking up three gigabytes of virtual memory. If you did a full dump, you're dumping three gigabytes of data to disk, which might not be the right dump to take, because you have to sit there and wait for the time it takes to write three gigabytes. So you can tell it that you want to take a mini dump, or you can tell it you want to take a full dump. You can actually take a mini dump that's bigger than a full dump, if that makes sense. But there's different command line parameters you can pass to tell it to put more information into the dump file. You can also use Task Manager. If I go and open up the Windows Task Manager, if I right click, there's an option there that says Create Dump File. If I was working with an end user, and an application was hung, if the application didn't crash, but the application was just doing nothing, I could say, right click, create a dump file, get the user to send the dump file to me, or connect to their machine and download it, open it up in the debugger, look at the stacks, go back and look at the names of the functions, see what it was looking for. If you see, for example, that it's trying to connect to a remote server, Go and look and find out, is that remote server healthy? Is that remote server processing requests? If not, that's the reason why the application's hanging, because it can't get information back from the system it's trying to communicate to. So there's a lot of different things we can do. Looking at these stacks is extremely useful. It tells us a lot about the system. So one final thing we can do as well, we can attach a kernel debugger as well. So not only can we see the application, but we can see the whole operating system itself. We can also see all the other applications on the box as well. So in your environment, you probably have a lot of applications that rely on other applications to be on that system. One application could appear hung, but if you go and attach to that and you look at it, you find out it's actually waiting on another process. 
that can be difficult in a production environment because you need to jump between each of these processes, keep attaching debuggers to each of those. And it can be difficult to find out how they're talking to each other. If we can look at the operating system, we can go below the applications, we can find out more about what's going on in the system. In order to do that, no, we need to start in debugging mode. So we need to use commands such as bcd edit. We can also get to this from the boot menu. We can, uh, we can press F8. And so I have a, a virtual machine here. Uh, this is running Windows 7. So this has been booted in debugging mode. So I went and ran bcd edit before. And one thing I did, if you just look at my, uh, the settings of my virtual machine, you'll see that there's an option here for the COM port or the serial port. And what I've gone and done is I've mapped this to a named pipe. So the virtual machine, it thinks it's talking to a COM port, but really it's it gone and exposed this named pipe. Now the debugger can go and talk to that named pipe, which means I can set up a debugging connection. So all I need to do now, because I've booted in the debugging mode, I just need to go and attach a debugger. So I can just go and open up WinDBG, and there's an option here that says kernel debug. And by default, it puts the com as the port name. What I can do here is just go ahead and type the name of the pipe, which is debugger. Then just tell it it's a pipe. Click OK. And if I just force this to break in, uh, shortly what we should see is it should connect. Now what's happened is we've broken in at the operating system level. If I go back to that virtual machine, you'll see nothing responds now because all of that's frozen. So not only can I look at the state of that one application, I can look at the state of all the applications on the system. So what I can do is I can jump back in and just go go and now it's running. And what I can do quickly, there's a tool here in the debugging tools, which I've installed locally on this machine, called Global Flags. And if I run this Global Flags utility, what I can do is I can select the image I'm interested in. So I could say, for example, notepad.exe. And I can scroll down the bottom here and say, uh, once I press the tab key, that I want to run a debugger. And the name of the debugger I want to run is NTSD, which is just a command line version of the debugger. And I can say I want to run NTSD minus D, which means when the debugger runs, pipe all that information out over that kernel debugger transport. So if I go and click OK, and if I zoom out, and now if I go and run Notepad, you'll see the machine appears frozen. If I jump back to the debugger, you'll see now that that process is now running inside the debugger. So now I can control not only that process, but also the operating system itself. What can I do? I could, for example, go and set a breakpoint on a piece of code. So shell about W and continue. So when I jump back, if I click on help and I click on about, it breaks into the debugger. What can I do here? I can look at the stack. Not only can I look at the stack, I can also see the parameters that were passed to that function. So if I went and looked at the documentation for this function, if I went to the website msdn.microsoft.com, shellabout is a documented API. So if you want to know more about these functions, punch these in. Go look in a website or go, like in a, a search engine or go directly to this website and look at these. So one thing we'll see here, the second parameter actually points to a, an application, the name that it wants to appear in the dialog box. And if we look at that inside the debugger, we'll see that value shell about return address, first parameter, second parameter. Copy that, DC, notepad. It's a Unicode string. I can use a du command, display that as Unicode values. It says notepad. But because I have a debugger attached, I can change those values as well. So what I can do is say edit as a Unicode string at this address, and I'm in Finland, so I'll say Finland. So I'm gonna go and replace 
the word notepad with Finland. What happens when I press go? If I jump back to my virtual machine, and if I zoom in, you see that it's now changed. It says about Finland. And of course, as I said, I have full control. I can break in and I can do other nasty stuff as well. Anyone seen a blue screen in Windows? Anyone not seen a blue screen in Windows, rather? I can type dot crash, in which case, if I jump back, you'll see now it's actually gone ahead and blue screened that box. But you'll see it's also writing a dump. So I could actually go and take that dump file, and I could analyze that and find out exactly what was going on. All right. Further information, of course, the Windows internals book. Uh, excellent source of information I recommend is the advanced debugging book as well. So this was written by two engineers in Microsoft, so it contains a lot of useful stuff. And also a couple of websites as well. Um, dumpanalysis.org contains a lot of information. It contains pattern information. So the guy that created this website has gone and looked at different types of crashes. So you can go and take those stacks, take the information from the stack, search on those. If you find a match, that could be your problem. So then you could actually find uh, that was the cause of the problem. So that's it for me. I'm going to stick around for a few minutes. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to come up and ask. Other than that, please fill out your evaluations. They're extremely useful. And enjoy the rest of the conference. And thank you very much. <laughs>